Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, November webinar, and welcome to those of you that um, coming in from Open Source Ecology's uh, side of things. Uh, I am. My name is Alexander Dale. I'm the head of Engineers for a Sustainable World, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our webinar with uh, Martin Jakubowski, who's the head and founder of Open Source Ecology. Um, Martin is a former TED speaker and a nuclear or a physics. PhD from Poland um, and has done a whole pile of different things and has a real open source ecology is a really amazing project that ESW is really pleased to be working with. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to let let him talk and uh, we'll have questions at the end. There's a questions box at the side um, where you can type in questions one, as you think of them. Um, so you don't have to write them mm -hmm. down and forget them for later. Uh, and we'll, we should have plenty of time to talk about things at the end. Uh, Great. So uh, Martin, over to you. Okay, excellent. So, welcome. Uh, I'll just go through uh, an introduction of the project and then where we are right now and how ESW can be involved, what, what I see as some potential here. So, my name is Marcin, founder of Open Source Ecology. And we came up with a big, hairy, audacious goal. And that is, we've identified the 50 most important machines that it takes for modern life to exist. Everything from a tractor to an oven to a circuit maker, and then we create open source, do-it-yourself blueprints that anyone can build and maintain the fraction of the cost. And this is the Global Village construction set. So is this reinventing the wheel? In some way, it is, but we're doing it differently. So let me tell you a story. So I was born in Poland, and I remember some hard times back there. So so my, actually my grandparents were... Um, this was, this was World War II. My grandmother was in a concentration camp. My grandfather was derailing German supply trains during World War II. And when I left Poland at the age of 10, this is what I saw. So this is tanks rolling down my streets. No, this is not a parade. This is the real time, the great times of material scarcity behind the Iron Curtain. So that's, that's a bit of my history. So then things got better. I moved to America. I went to Princeton undergrad. I had a PhD in fusion energy from University of Wisconsin-Madison, and things were great <laughs> until I discovered that I was useless, so had no practical skills. I always thought about the power of science, technology, knowledge to change people's lives for better, but the farther I went in my education, the more useless I felt. I always remembered the different problems we have, like hunger, poverty, and war, and I decided to do something about it. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. So that's that's the classical story where I bought the tractor, then it broke, I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again, and pretty soon I was broke too. So that's that is my story. And I realized that the truly effective low cost tools that I needed to build a sustainable life and settlement were either too expensive or didn't exist yet. So I needed tools that were robust, modular, highly efficient and optimized, low cost, made from local recycled materials, designed for a lifetime, not obsolescence. So I found that I would have to build it myself and I did just that and I tested them. And I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So I published all the designs, schematics, instructional videos and budgets on a wiki, and then contributors from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines, doing dedicated project visits. So far we've built out 17, it's actually 17 now, unique prototypes, and there were 12 replications of different machines around the world as of 2012. In 2011 I made it to the world stage with TED as a TED Fellow, and things were going well. We've had replications throughout the world, including America. This is in Guatemala for the tractor. This is in a brick press in China. This is one in Italy. Turkey for the tractor. This is, the, this is in LA. And last year we got up to version 4 of the tractor. We, we did continuous prototyping one after another. Uh, this year we built Black Track version of 5 and are partnering with our school in, at Blair Grocery, uh, an urban gardening project in New Orleans to test this machine and, and we're seeing the first use in real life in real urban agriculture. 
this year we also actually got up to version six, and this is the prototype six, where with the tractor, the saw pulverizer shown here, and the brick press shown like this, we pressed bricks to build the first prototype of the OSC micro house. And this is how it looks. I'm ready to move in almost in a few days. We're just finishing this up. And there's various other partnerships that we have, like Velocar, uh, an open source microcar. There's lots of, lots of different things that are going on. Well, the key to this entire game is documentation. And so what we do is use Dozuki as our doc documentation platform where for the whole Global Village construction set of the 50 machines, we, we go, you can go to Dozuki, opensourceecology.dozuki.com, and you can find the front page with all the different machines. You click on one, you get to uh, the different modules. Um, so what we do is module-based design. The way we approach the problem is that we break each machine down into modules so that they can be developed and built in parallel. That's a route where we can increase our development velocity rapidly. And we keep track of this in spreadsheets. Um, we're following the, you can say, the Wikipedia model of development where a large number of contributors can take bite-sized tasks, tasks and develop the project. So, uh, you know, just one comment on this. If we were able to get the intense amount of contributions like Wikipedia, we'd solve the entire project in like three months. So, but the question is, of course, how do you organize a large number of people to do that um, when you're dealing with the real hardware? And real hardware has a whole level of complexity. You need the physical plant, the workshop, real metal, heavy machines, and all kinds of stuff that is more difficult than just information work. We also host design sprints where people come online to do development work on specific topics. Um, but a lot of that is about building things and we also get supported by true fans, people who are donating money to the project because they believe in the power of open source hardware. And we believe that open source hardware is so critical because while software and information technology is all great, still the, about 80% of the economy is still physical production. It, it has been like that and probably always will be therefore to open up hardware to create better products through collaborative development is our goal. I'd like to take you into a little more details about how we do the development. So if you go to to opensourceecology.dozuki.com. You can click on any one of our projects. Like for example, laser cutter. You will get down into the second second item here is modules. Uh, if you click on that, okay, let's go back. If you click on the modules, so that's that's the module based design. You can see all the different parts. And if you click on one of these parts, like for example, overall machine or the frame, you will be taken to a development template that carries at least, let's see, that has a spreadsheet of different, so I, I want to actually go through that briefly. If, um, if we're going to be involved collaborating on a project, there's basically a whole number of things you need to develop for any project to take life, and that is starting from the requirements to the to the breakdown of the machine into modules, to interface design to show how the modules fit together, to, to concept, to, to the actual technical drawings, calculations, computer aided manufacturing files, there's all kinds of diagrams like hydraulics, there's bills of materials, fabrication instructions, etc. So, so we go through a whole range of de development for each project. Um, actually the what if people collaborate with us typically okay people collaborate with us we we have people keep their work logs to track track their development when people are on site we what we do is this is our documentation platform for images where if we do any build, like this is actually happening today 
you see these these pictures coming up online we we do live uploads of footage from the builds to Trovebox where from Trovebox uh, we also do live uploads of videos um, we also use a platform called Latiku for collaborative video editing so that here's an example of an instructional which we are now able since a couple of months now able to generate in real time as we actually do the builds so we upload the images real time we shoot some videos and there's people collaborating remotely to to do the those Zuki instructions we, we post instructionals by taking the pictures adding the comments of step step by step instructions so that when we're done at the end of the day we actually have this document so that others can replicate and that's that's a major milestone I'm not sure anybody else is doing that so then that way we can build build items like our micro house um, pro uh, produce effective development so so this is a big milestone we reached last year we built that press that brick press in the back there with 12 people in a single day and that's an example of the module based design where we can tackle the machine in parallel with a with a large team of collaborative production where we work together on individual modules and then we flock together and assemble them in rapid time so we're really pushing the limits of efficient production which we're calling extreme manufacturing it's it's named after extreme programming where we're using agile um, module based design and development process to get things done That's that's actually all that I have for as far as a formal presentation. And um, as far as let me actually let me pull up some notes on on how I see um, potential collaboration with engineers for a sustainable world. So so I, I discussed how uh, basically in this development process, part of that is is on site where we do the build outs, and part of it is remote. And, and perhaps and this is a discussion I have to open up. How would it be if, if um, for example, Engineers for a Sustainable World were to take one of the projects is, is, Can you hear? Can you guys hear? Because it's, it's telling me I'm having connection issues. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, so if we have good interest from engineers for sustainable world chapters I would propose that we we get together on, on remote design sprints where where a chapter say you know say you can have a chapter of like 12 students working remotely on one of the machines and not only machine but a, but a module and we can in fact get several chapters working in real time doing that then imagine getting a whole team of people doing development remotely at the same time well let's perhaps we can try that that's that's one way we'd like to see if we can collaborate and but perhaps yeah so Alex if if you're there maybe um, perhaps we can transition into the question and answer session so so I could kind of gauge what people want to know about the project and how we can work together um, so Alex if you can can continue that. Great. Yes, we should do questions. Um, Peter, are you there? I am here. Great. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to toss them in the question box, and mm -hmm. um, we can we can have them asked. And. Mm -hmm. Do I also see the questions, or you are should. You, you pretty much? Mm -hmm. Is that in a in a chat box there?
So Chris Spy has asked why the name open source ecology. Yeah, so so open source is clear as the, the method of development that we we take on. As far as ecology, ecology refers to the integration of all the different systems that make a world work, from the human to the natural to the technical spheres because we believe that to provide the best solutions you have to be a radical boundary crosser who pretty much is able to feed from many different disciplines to to make a better world so the eco ecology refers to the integration of disciplines and human and natural ecosystems that that are out there mm -hmm. Does that does that do that? Are there any other questions or I have one I have one question actually, which is kind of a weird far future piece. Um, which is uh, if you in in the far in the future, if all of this stuff works, what's the long term future mm -hmm. of OSE? Does it does it cease to exist yeah, once these machines so... exist? <laughs> right. So I didn't talk about what the what the longer term plan is, but but right now, basically, we're going in this uh, accelerating our pace of development to to finish the entire global village construction set by the end of 2015. Where in order for that to happen, to since we have 16 prototypes, 16 different machines that have been built out right now. There's only about four that are really close to being final products, like the tractor, the brick press, salt pulverizer, power unit. There's some other ones in development, like CNC torch table and others. But point is, in, a, in the next two years, we, we need to achieve about 1,000 hours of development time per week, uh, harvesting pretty much the, the effective full-time development of about 25 people to make these basic machines happen. So once that's once that's complete, we go into the next phase, with, which which focuses on education. So the way we see the machines being replicated is by by a production model, which involves workshops where we basically teach people the experience of of effective production. So for example, take a machine like a laser cutter, or a brick press, or a micro car. We want to develop a model, kind of like uh, there's Local Motors does that as an example of such a model where people are coming in to, to a workshop setting where they build out something uh, for themselves and they pay for that experience. So we'd like to introduce a model where, where a person has a chance to either buy a finished product from us or anybody else since our blueprints are open or actually participate in an experience where they get to do that and and by that we're creating a a model where people get reskilled and reconnected back to the kinds of things the different things that they use and by so if if by 2015 we finish all the machines our our next goal is actually to create education and training centers like this where where it would really be something like a like an altern a real alternative to to education where people learn a wide variety of very, very practical skills and the, the education centers become open source product development centers where there's education happening, there's production happening, 
So we'd actually like to create a, a large number of these facilities worldwide once the tools are, are completed by the end of 2015. And in order to make that happen, imagine that we have really low-cost ways to do that when we have our own machinery, our tractors, our equipment, our, our energy production equipment, uh, fabrication equipment, which allows us to, to replicate the technologies or replicate actual facilities um, worldwide at very low cost. So then it, so it becomes a question of, of finding people who become the leaders of these facilities and uh, disseminating the, the kind of model of production and education worldwide. And you know, just as like an example with the micro house that we built, um, that's an example of, of pretty efficient construction and with that example we're seeing that the machines are working to create real things with all open source equipment and, and that the price point at which you can do that becomes actually really efficient. And, and then it gets really crazy if you could actually melt your own metal and, and hot roll it to generate steel from scrap feedstocks or even the, the most advanced machine, which is the aluminum extraction from clay. Imagine taking dirt and converting that to clay, to dirt to, sorry, to aluminum because clay is aluminum silicate. Uh, so we're, we're getting so crazy as, as far as showing that just about anything can be built from on-site local resources. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is to, to develop a large number of these facilities worldwide, and of course there's going to be replications that happen passively on a side, just like a lot have happened already, so people are free to, to use these technologies in whatever applications, whether they're producers or builders of any kind, creators of any kind. Uh, but as far as OSE itself, I'd like to see a number of these facilities get distributed worldwide where people... Uh, have, where there's a real mechanism to, to to bring this technology to all over the world and all these facilities would collaborate on a viable open source product development pipeline that becomes a real alternative to proprietary research and development. So for example if a company wants to develop something they can consider more or less reinventing the wheel by themselves or they can tap this mechanism of collaborative development which can benefit everybody and, and the blueprints are, or designs are, are put into a common repository that everyone can draw from. So that's, that's the basic, basic picture. I think that sounds awesome. I also, I think, I think we're kind of trending in, in similar directions with OSE and ESW, and that both are trying to create this network of people that are doing similar things and can share knowledge. It's an interesting thing of like trying to do physical, yeah. very community level changes in sustainability by using the internet, but not depending on it in the same sense. Yeah, yeah. So Alex, I mean, is there, what's to be said about about how you know the interest of the different different chapters across the states? Can we talk about a specific, uh, maybe you know, picking some machine and then getting dedicated uh, design sprints around that to actually actually doing development work? And I mean, potentially people could also visit us, vis visit us on site, um, maybe during the summers or whatever. But but there's different options from the remote design sprints that we can host to to hosting people on site. I mean, did you have any further discussions on that or? Uh, we comments. basically um, we've had some discussions. Some of the people on this call are from RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, and they've expressed they've had like twelve people that are interested in participating. Um, and we're also working on putting together a group at Ohio State, um, as I think we previously mentioned. Um, it's also like mm -hmm. it's up to our membership to decide that they want to jump in and get involved. I, I think if we got mm -hmm. three or four different chapters, it would be really mm -hmm. cool to have some specific design sprints around that machine because it would let some of the chapters work together as well. Um, and that's something we'd really like to see. Yeah, would you would you see see it happening that, that the different chapters work together on the same same machine or or, or more like different different ones? Um, I think it's going to depend a little bit on the skills, but I suspect that um, we'll have enough that are interested in in a similar area that we could do uh, the same machine. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah.
If if uh, we wanted to get some of your help, Alex, in terms of organizing some of the the college tour for next year. Yeah, yeah, um, I think we'll definitely we'll definitely look at that. Um, there are two questions here. Yeah. Um, one is you know how specialized are the machines? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Chris Ty. This is from Chris Ty, and he would uh, just listening to a podcast where they brought up a giant like six hundred thousand dollar cotton picker. Um, which uh -huh. is the reason why cotton thread makers chose American cotton, um, which is like super specialized. Um, and I know that some of the GV mm. uh, CS is a little bit more general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do we approach that? We approach it from the standpoint that different modules can be interchanged. So, so for example, we see a picture where a combine, like for example, a machine like a combine, which harvests and threshes grains, which is one of the most important machines in the world because if you eat bread or eat anything, it's probably been harvested. If it's any kind of grain or grain crop, it's been harvested by a combine. But we take a look at that as as a combination of different functions that are uh, built on a on a particular platform. And what you notice is that each machine will have a bunch of common common pieces, like you know the drives. Each one of these machines will have a drive system. Will have an engine. It might have some kind of a cutting mechanism or some kind of a, a threshing or some other mechanism. And we basically take that apart and say, okay, well, let's let's design the machines as modules that fit together so you can reconfigure these things. Like, for example, uh, to give you an example, that we can take our hydraulic power unit, the power cube, basically put wheels on it and have a small-scale garden tractor. Or you can take a number of these, like two or four, you can stack them together. You can put on larger wheel units. You can put on loader arms. You have a you have a full size tractor. You can modify these up to up to a bulldozer, maybe a road grader. You can add you know your cutting head on it to turn it into a, a combine or some kind of a harvesting machine. So we're really pushing the limits by making each piece dismountable. Like the wheel units, we've shown that you can make them totally flexible like for example the trencher which is a current if you look at our facebook right now you'd see some pictures of the time lapses of the trencher build but that big cutting wheel this five foot diameter cutting wheel we can actually use that exact wheel in another application uh, as a large truck steel tractor wheel so by removing the teeth that are cutting teeth like a trencher which is a machine that trenches so you can lay for example like water pipe it's used to uh, cut deep troughs or, or uh, for, for laying pipe or something like that. Well, let's take that and use it as a wheel for a tractor. It's like we're getting so radical as that and uh, allowing each machine to literally be, take, you know, take a Lego set, life-size Lego set. That's literally the best metaphor and it's, it's quite real as far as what we're accomplishing with that. So we're using so, so the, if you have seen our the structures, how how things that we build work, typically we use four by four square tubing, steel tubing as the structures. We can b bind these together with bolts. We can reconfigure them. Uh, you know, you can make a small frame. You can make a huge frame. You can pay. You can put multiple wheels or multiple engine units on devices. So it's it's very flexible. And we're even seeing that the same kind of a tubing material, we just built out an iron worker machine, for example, where we can cut, uh, just cut half, uh, one inch by, by eight inch steel using the machine made of the same type of tubing to which we add our specialized components like the cutting blades. But we're seeing that this, this, this method is extremely flexible and you can get both precision and high high force resistance. It's, it's like building a machine, the, the iron worker, which has 120 tons at the cutting edge of the blade. Well, we can keep a band, uh, a blade gap in that machine that's like seven thousandths of an inch. So the same rough bolt together structure can get you high precision, high force. You can make tiny machines with it. You can make huge machines by using multiple beams uh, bonded together with many bolts and things like that. So uh, it's totally about letting somebody have the control to modify it for, for their needs. Now, if you need a specialized machine, you can you know you can take you can take our system and and make something that pretty much does a certain function. Uh, but our our 
our guideline is lifetime design where you can if it breaks you can fix it a big a huge huge part of that is is that someone can can fix it because if you don't have specialized parts it's much much easier to get them so so the drawback of the specialized machines is that uh, you're very much dependent on very unique supply chains which if the thing breaks it can be very expensive or or you just can't get the parts if you're in the third world somewhere or whatever you're just, just not going to be able to get parts and you see fields of broken machines sitting all strewn across all of Africa things like that so uh, the flexibility is what we're after in the lifetime design by the by the generalization of our equipment to very to the simplest possible parts and systems that we can imagine so that that wraps that, that up uh, and uh, the second question um, there is so so a second question here um, and you know yell at me if this has already been asked um, mm -hmm. what policy and regulation issues um, are you facing or do you see any that could prevent the growth or adoption of the project yeah that's gonna be I think it depends where you are uh, and what you're building like for example in the United States where we operate I mean we don't need any permission external permission to build a device like a tractor now if you're in Europe they have more stringent requirements I believe there they have various uh, I guess air quality issues or just uh, other regulations where you can't just produce that so depends where you are uh, for if we're building a, um, a product like the micro house well for example at factory farm we don't have to worry much about codes but if say you're in an earthquake zone in the middle of a city with stringent codes like in LA uh, you're gonna help have to go to to a lot of paperwork to get the thing approved especially if people are not used to to a particular thing but as far as right now we haven't been hit with the the regulations yet I suspect that in the future uh, there might be uh, basically any competitors that 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 um, anyone who's our competitor might might like to take the throw the book at us so-called take legal channels to to take us out <laughs> of business uh, that's something we might have to be ready for but by that time if we you know if we publish the blueprints openly and uh, get a lot of support from that from people who are using this I think and if it's working effectively if it's safe and and all of that then there's the power of uh, that has a certain power that that you can't just just squash that easily because the things are working and and the popular power of that is actually making it making it go without stop but definitely there's a there's a risk of of um, people I mean just just in terms of competitors or just some things like you know if we if we end up building cars you know the OSC micro car tilting micro car uh, of course there's regulation for vehicles like that but but one way to to address that is if people are actually building an item for themselves which is the the collaborative production workshop model imagine you come to build your own micro car well you're allowed to do that nobody can tell you that you can't do that so in the distributed production digital fabrication flexible fabrication model of tomorrow where you can produce things on a micro scale individuals will be able much more able to do that for themselves so say you can't sell the thing well there's so many people out there that can build them or download the blueprints to build it for themselves and that's one way that that people actually people are taking the responsibility for for their machines and for their production as opposed to regulation which tries to protect people from produce from producers who might not be ethical so in the future economy where we see much more much many more people being involved in the production system those issues are addressed in part by how this new system works mm -hmm. So any other questions and 
or offers of any of you students to to bring me in as a speaker because I like next year I our goal is to have pretty much uh, 12 to 18 people on site at all times throughout the year so that's why we're going on an ambitious college tour to recruit people yeah uh, to no I mean awareness I'm I am hoping that over time as, as our chapters get used to the idea and then they say oh here's a clear project that we can pick up I am hoping mm -hmm. that we get you know a third of our chapters to pick this up because I think it's yeah. something that fits really nicely with what we're trying to do and it breaks mm -hmm. down into you know digestible pieces in nice ways so yeah. Yeah. Like, I am hopeful that, you know, your college tour will work out well and that you'll go mm -hmm. be going to some of the ESW schools. So the chapters there will pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also hopeful that just some other some of the chapter relations stuff will, will pick up and we'll, we'll get some more schools from that. Yeah, so I'm hoping yeah. to get you 10 schools at least. Um, yeah, more as we grow. <laughs> Excellent. How, how many chapters do you have right now? Uh, 35. 35. Yeah. yeah. And then we're yeah. looking at, you know, two or three other schools like kind of at any given time for student chapters. And we've got three or three cities that are looking at professional chapters. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got both student and professional chapters. It's, it's a, it's mostly students, like 33 mm -hmm. students and two professionals. Um, yeah. We've, we're, we're growing out that professional chapters piece, but certainly yeah. that can be a venue for working with OSE. Yeah, and and do you have uh, I forget what we talked about last time with respect to your chapter standards? Like how how can we learn from that? Because actually at OSC, as far as us creating chapters in different places, we could possibly learn some things from you guys too. I don't know, do you do you guys have any um, other documented like your chapter standards? Yeah, so we, we we've gone back and forth on on what chapters have to do in terms of being highly mm -hmm. recognized. But generally, it's you know have a certain number of members registered with us, pay chapter dues, have a registered faculty advisor. Um, but beyond mm -hmm. that, we're little, we have chapters a lot of leeway on what projects they choose. We try not to be, we try to let them have a lot of autonomy there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but in terms of being highly recognized, we want to see people doing, you know, two or three chapters, and then we have a chapter relations board that helps them make sure that turnover at schools doesn't kill them and help them do membership retention and fundraising and these sorts of pieces. Mm -hmm. And having that, having that yeah. support network and having them kind of be forced to talk to each other has done a lot to make the chapters stick around. There's been a lot more strength, strong chapters because of that. Yeah. 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 I'm looking at your starting a chapter page. Uh, do you have on your website, do you have any of your chapter standards or guidelines or? Um, yeah, I think we have them. If not, I'll, I'll send you a copy. Um, okay. And I've got I've got a few more questions here. Um, yep. One go is, ahead, ahead. you know, what what projects are the most well realized and which need the wor most work? Um, and also, can mm -hmm. you um, talk about how to contact OSE for the academic tour or to get involved in the video? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So the first, well, let's answer the second question first. So you can email me. So it's Marchin M A R C I N at opensourceecology.org. Uh, it's the most direct way since I'm quite involved in organizing this tour since I have a lot of contacts I'm following up with, but just email me, Marchin, spelled M-A-R-C-I-N. I just put it as a response to the question, actually, um, and we can uh -huh. make sure it comes out in the emails. You can also, if you're if you're with a chapter and want to work on things, um, get in touch with us, and we're happy to help deal with that, too. So. Yeah, yeah. As far as the dedicated project visits, you can... Send either me or our technical community manager, Audrey. Uh, it's Audrey, A U D R E Y, at opensourceecology.org. Um, we're taking applications. You can, you can take a look at um, dedicated project visits on our website. Let me send you a link. So this is. Uh, take a look at that on our wiki uh, it's a bit about how you can get involved on site and and we welcome all kinds of opportunities like if you'd like to do a class project or a summer break or volunteer experience um, or an internship a, a summer visit we welcome that I mean it would be awesome if we could get people doing their, their final projects and that's not only engineering, but also documentation. There's video production. There's graphics and, and internet coding stuff. So this 
plenty of areas to get involved in. Um, that's that's that. And as far as the first question, um, what needs most work? What's most finished? So the brick press is the first machine that we actually began building a long time ago when we started with a blank piece of land and needed housing. Uh, we experimented with some natural building structures, found that it's pain, painful labor, and then we built the brick press, which works really well. So that machine is pretty much complete, and and there's um, the we did learn a couple of things about it. We are going to so so it's pretty far along to the point that we definitely recommend that you replicate that. There's now we moved to a pressure-based controller with a pressure sensor. We're going to make the final version of that controller. Right now, it's pretty much uh, kind of like too many wires hanging. <laughs> Uh, we're going to make a professional version of that controller. Any people who also know electronics would be welcome to to talk to me about that. Or regarding mechanical engineering, we're going to redesign the the soil loading drawer by basically putting linear guides on that so it doesn't move to the sides or uh, basically it doesn't cause abrasion against the sides of the machine. So there's a one major development that's forthcoming. And we're aiming to do that by January probably because. Uh, with a brick press, we're we're actually uh, calling out for clients. So it's another thing. If if you live in a southern state, we're aiming to do a workshop somewhere in the southern United States in January or February. Uh, we're actually going to build build another micro house uh, for someone who would like to have that built and host a workshop around that, where uh, the person who's a host pays for the materials and people who come to that workshop actually pay for the workshop to get an educational experience. So that's, well, that's the brick press. The brick press, the tractor, uh, the tractor is up to version six. There's still a few issues to be resolved on that. And um, we aim to pretty much finish those two next year as far as pretty much full product releases. Um, our power cube is also quite robust. It works, works quite well. And then there's a soil pulverizer. That that basically the the four construction products are quite far along. And then uh, as far as needing help, I mean, there's a whole range of of machines that need help along the construction and agriculture lines. But the good news is that we're using this modular uh, life size Lego set construction set method where you can build out var variants of a given machine. Like from a from a tractor, you can go to a truck. Literally, you can go to a well digging machine or a sawmill built with a similar construction technique. So if you look at our list, um, I guess if you take a look at uh, opensourceecology.org and if you go to the to the tools page, you can see that just about any of the, the mechanical agriculture construction utility tools lend themselves to, I think those a lot of those would be nice engineering projects. Um, for, for students because the, the design method is rather simple and it's something that, that one could design and prototype in rapid time because, because of our bolt together design method. Um, so as far as immediate priorities for next year, we will be taking the brick press, the tractor to the last mile of development Right now, we've got a person here working on the computer-controlled torch table for cutting out this tubing and all these plates and, and modular building blocks from steel. So it's an automated steel cutting machine, the CNC torch table. Um, that's a that's a big priority for us. Next January and February, we'll be building out the OSC microcar with our collaboration with the, an excellent project, the Velocar project. You can look up Velocar. Uh, I can type that in, velocar.fr. Um, so that's that's another build that's forthcoming next year. Um, those are some of the some of the priorities. But basically, the fact is that we're looking at the entire set as if as if there's a person that wants to develop something, uh, talk to us, because if there's a person that's willing to put significant work into it, we'll take it. And it makes sense. It's 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 uh, somewhat opportunistic in that if we see teams or, or people that are very interested in something, we'll go with that. 
because our goal, after all, is to finish everything by the end of 2015, at least to the beta release stage. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, we're just about out of time anyway. Um, yep. Justin, I want to I want to thank you for showing up and talking with us for an hour. This has been great. Um, yep. I hope that people will uh, get involved with OSC, um, whether as a chapter or as an individual. I hope that we can help you on your tour mm -hmm. um, and help get some mm -hmm. audience mm -hmm. members and some rooms. Uh, and uh, if people are watching this, you know, ask some uh, ask some questions of us via email. Excellent. Yeah, so I welcome all kinds of feedback. Marchin at opensourceecology.org. So, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good evening. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Take care.